Hi, how's it going? So I made a little terminal game called Cemetery Escape. I wanted to show it to you and just talk a little bit about making terminal games. And uh, yeah, so let me just give you a quick demo. And before I actually start, you can play the game by going to my GitHub and checking out the game. If you have Go, a uh, recent version of Go, you can just install it. Otherwise, you can, uh, you can go to the releases and check it out. Okay, so I'm gonna use demo mode to show you how this game works. So in this uh, game, you are a little character who has to search tombstones to find a key. So you start off every level and you can look around and there's a door that you want to exit, but you can't exit the door till you find the key. So you have to search the tombstones. So I searched the tombstone, nothing there. Search this tombstone, I found the key and now I can go to the next level. Pretty simple, right? Press P to pause, okay. Now, in some levels, there'll be ghosts and this is a white ghost. And if you watch him, what he does is he, he wanders around and uh, you know, he goes here and there. Uh, the way his algorithm works is pretty simple. He chooses a location near him and tries to get to it. If I touch him, I die and I don't want that. So let's go get the key and go on to the next level. Now we've got this green ghost. This green ghost is what I call a follower. So he's going to try and follow me. His algorithm is pretty simple too. He's going to try and, if he is close to me, right? So if he, if he sees me, right? He's going to try and go directly to my location, but he's not smart, right? So watch him here. He's going to come directly to me, but there's tombstones in the way. So he's blocked. He can't get to me. All right. I'm going to, I found the key. I'm going to move on to the next level. Now I've got a hunter. Now these guys are much quicker and they're actually smart. So he's going to use a pathfinding algorithm to actually chase me around. So I can't just hide, uh, you know, so I better get out of here and then the game is done. Now that was the demo. The actual game has a lot more levels. This is the first level of the actual game. So you can see there's a lot more tombstones and there's a lot more you have to sort of look around and try and figure out how do you actually beat this level. Okay, I wanna quickly talk about some of the limitations of making a game in the terminal. So I'm in the terminal right now. You can see how many uh, cells that I have to work with. It's not very many, right? So let's say you have maybe 30 uh, rows to work with and maybe 100 columns. So so it's pretty small, right? You, you end up uh, with not, not a lot to work with there. For example, this is me in Vim. Right, and uh, you know every single thing you he see here is just like a single cell, right? Like, and there's there's not that many of them, right? So everything that you see here is a cell, and uh, you only get one character per cell, right? So in Vim, it's amazing that this is just a terminal application, application, but everything here is a single cell, right? Like it's it's text that you could copy and uh, you know paste somewhere else, right? So it's not pixels that we're dealing with as our as our rendering primitive. It is in fact a cell. And because that's true, because you're working with just cells, that means you can only have one thing at a cell at a time. You can have the letter T or the letter R. You can't have the letter R and T in there at the same time, unless you have some kind of glyph, which is a combination of those two things. So while this might look like a cool graphic, each thing at the bottom here is in fact just a single cell. Same thing here in my game, right? So every single thing here is just a single cell, right? Including the wall, right? So you'd have a, a line here and then a corner character here and then, you know, a, a pipe character down. Also, my game requires that you have a nerd font, right? A nerd font is a font that is patched so that it can show these different uh, glyphs, different images. Um, but if you don't have that and you press F, then I will just let you play this game without a nerd font, uh, right? So nerd font, no nerd font, right? And in this, we're just using characters that you almost certainly have. Uh, doesn't look as nice, but uh, it still works, right? Another limitation of the terminal is that there's no way to dig back into your rendered output and grab things. So if you're used to working uh, with the DOM, like I am as a developer, you can always query the DOM and just see what's the current state of the DOM. I can't do that uh, when I'm building this game because I can't uh, go to the what's called like the scroll back buffer. I can't go and read that. Uh, or at least certainly not easily. So I have to be a lot more deliberate about the game state, which I mean is a good practice anyways. If you're doing React or something like that in, in web development, you're not actually reading from the DOM. You have a state and you render to the DOM. Another issue I ran into is that there's no key up event. So initially I had the game where the way you would move is you would hold down the key to move, right? And so like you could move a fixed amount, right? And then stop or something like that. But uh, giving this game to my friend, who had a different uh, key delay than me, made the game almost unplayable for him because his key was not repeating quickly enough. So instead, you press the key, the guy will move until you press another key. And if you press space, he'll stop. Another issue is that the game is gonna look very different depending on the terminal emulator and font that you're using, right? So on the 
But right here I have this terminal emulator and font, which is called foot. On the left, I'm using WESTERM, right? And then if I actually went here into WESTERM uh, and use my regular font that I actually like to use, uh, let's just pull that up here. I like, I like this font these days, SureTech Mono. Uh, but now if I play the game, it looks, uh, you can see it just looks very different. So it, it's, again, it's not like the DOM where you can kind of control how things look. You're really limited to what the person has installed on their system. All that to say that you have to be a lot more flexible and forgiving with your rendering. It's possible that somebody's going to have way too many rows and columns and this thing's going to look tiny, tiny. So I put a message at the bottom just telling them, okay, you need to zoom in a little bit. But it's also possible that they can zoom in too much and now you're not going to see anything, right? So I have to calculate that and then, okay, great. This is, this is what it's supposed to look like. There's a few things in this game that uh, I'm glad I got working. So the first thing is, um, the entire map is not visible at one time. So we have like a viewport. Most of the time I make things in the terminal, you can see the entire map or whatever at once, right? Whereas here, uh, if you look in the top uh, left over here, there's a little arrow, like that's the direction that I can go, right? So if I, if I start moving over that way, the screen scrolls with me, right? So I can uh, move around like that. So you can have these really big maps, um, even though the terminal can only render so many characters. Another thing that I am quite happy with is the level editor. So initially a level was just a struct in Go, uh, but it kind of made it hard to like picture what is this thing actually going to look like. So I built myself a little editor where I just put down some strings, right? And like, here's the door, this is the player, this is a hunter, these are some stones, and then this is a key. So I can kind of design the level. Uh, there's not a lot of level design going on here, but I do try and make the levels, you know, get gradually harder or have interesting challenges. Definitely the thing I'm most proud of is getting this pathfinding algorithm to work. Uh, being a web dev developer primarily, I don't spend a lot of time writing these kinds of algorithms, right? So it is kind of fun to have something like this work. So what I'm doing is I'm using ASTAR, which is a version of Dijkstra with a weight, right? Or uh, Anyway, if you've ever written it, you know. If you don't, then it's hard to explain. I certainly can't explain it. But uh, it's kind of fun to see like how does something like this work? How does he know? How does he know which way to follow me? Right? And uh, using like a priority queue under the hood. So yeah, I was happy with that. Final thoughts on this. Um, definitely don't build a game in the terminal. It just, it's not the right medium for it, but it, it's, it's a fun challenge. But like if you're actually trying to make a game that you want to be good, definitely use like an actual game engine. There's just so many things that can go wrong. Right? Like somebody has a weird font, it just doesn't work. Or somebody's using colors that you wouldn't expect, it won't work key inputs might not work. So yeah, I don't know. I would recommend that uh, if you are actually trying to build a game, this is not the right uh, platform for you. Huge shout out to Bubble Tea, which is the Go framework that I use uh, for building this game. So uh, it handles things like rendering, uh, key presses, th that type of stuff, right? Which, I mean, these things are not impossible to do on your own, but it sure is nice to have something uh, purpose built for this. Um, and it's kind of fun to go through their, their code and see like, how are they doing this? Like, uh, well, here's an example, right? So if I, if I run this, right. And, uh, nobody's moving right now, nothing's moving. So is it re-rendering or not? What do you think? Right. And in fact, it's actually doing a diffing algorithm to see like what's actually changed. What do we actually need to re-render? Right. Um, yeah. So I found that kind of cool. I also had fun, uh, profiling this thing, not really profiling, just sort of looking and seeing, like, okay, is this gonna spin up my fan, right? So here's the process right there called cemetery. You can see how much of my CPU it's actually using, um, which is which is kind of interesting. My initial version of this had it using 20% of my CPU. And that seems like a lot, but the reason was um, when I was compiling a view, what I was doing is I was just adding strings together, but I was adding a string for each cell. So, you know, maybe a thousand strings per render, but the render is every 10 milliseconds, right? So it's it's a lot, again, a lot different than web development where you don't really need to worry about these things unless you're doing something really wrong. Whereas here, I actually do have to think about this. So instead of just adding strings together, I use a string builder for the first time, which was, again, pretty cool. Okay, that's it. I hope you check it out. Uh, and I really hope you're having a great day. Talk to you later. Bye.